Well, so you are not the center of the world. This practice of worship every week, and now we're worshiping across our our campus as we do every week. I welcome everyone in the gym or in the great hall who are with us now. I just want to affirm all of you for being here today and for the regular practice for many of us, for most of us, to come together to worship him every week. Because in this moment of worship, we disrupt the patterns of our lives. We disrupt our our personal patterns and we're reminded again in worship that we can take the focus, finally, take the focus off of me, off of us, and turn it on to him. This act of worship is a disruptive, subversive, countercultural act. Every time we gather, we're going against the patterns of this world. And we're reminded again, the world does not revolve around me. It was in the 15th century, the famous astronomer uh, Nicholas Copernicus, he made the discovery that shook the world when he told everyone that what was commonly known as the the, uh, geocentric model of the universe, that everything revolved around the earth was actually not true. Now imagine that, that we would assume that the world centers on us and where we are. But he said instead, no, it's a heliocentric uh, universe, or at least our solar system, now we know, everything centers around the sun, not the earth. This brought about what what was called the Copernican Revolution. And it was ultimately made popular through Galileo and his published findings not too long after that. It was later in the 20th century that Jean Piaget, the great child psychologist, said, There comes a point when every child needs to have their own Copernican revolution. (laughs) And everyone with preschoolers said, amen. Amen. And everyone living with a selfish spouse said, okay, so I won't go there. But (laughs) be careful, be careful when when you place your amens in there. But uh, we all need our own Copernican revolution, don't we? Because we live in the age of self. In fact, we, we live in the age of the selfie. You know, I read this week, there, there's the most recent data that I saw. Between 2017, no, 2011, 2017, listen to this. Of the 93 million selfies posted every day, between that period of time, 253 people, no, 59 people died in 137 selfie-related accidents. Think about that. Someone trying to capture themselves. Maybe, maybe they got too close to the edge. They got too close to the action. And that number continues to increase. There are more people who are killed by selfie-related accidents than there are sharks who attack us on the globe. By a long shot. This self-centered life is killing us, literally, and in more ways than one. Because we know this, to live a self-focused life is a self-destructive life. And yet we all wrestle with this. We've said that the gospel of our day, the secular gospel of our day, is you do you. You be you. And don't let any outside external authority tell you how to live your life. Determine who you are, how you will live, and and just focus on yourself. And yet, if a self-focused life brings death, as the scriptures teach us, then then, then a a life of self-denial brings life. This is the countercultural, subversive way of Jesus. And this is the beginning and end of the Christian life. And so today what I want to do is unite us all across the life of our church around this idea of submission as we enter into the Easter season. Many of you know if you're in connect groups that we are now entering into a season where we're practicing the way of Jesus, seeking to follow his way, a rule of life of our rabbi Jesus. 
We've said that to be like him, which is the Christian life, having been rescued uh, by him because of our sin, now we seek to live just like him. And so the idea here, the premise is that we live lives that look comprehensively just like him. We actually do what our rabbi did and how he has taught us to live. But now we do it under the power of the Holy Spirit, those of us who know him and are following him. So this past uh, Wednesday night, Ash Wednesday, serves as a portal into this season. And I am praying that God will bring about personal renewal in every life in our church family. I want to challenge you, don't miss the next six weeks. Come every, every Sunday and, and be involved in our connect groups. And you have received also this uh, devotional guide. If you haven't received it, or, or I say that, it's in your bulletin today and they're out and about all around our campus. Don't leave without getting one of these or you'll miss the key piece, which is you practicing, not simply hearing, learning, but practicing the spiritual disciplines that we're going to look at over the next week's head. I want every person, and if you're a guest, please join us. But every member, every one of us diving in. There's special um, sections for family discussion. We can teach our children how to submit to the authority of parents. That's a good first start. That's the first week. And so we teach and we guide each of us will be able to practice the way of Jesus. There's also a, a fasting guide at the back end. Did some teaching around that this past week. We can fast in different forms as we submit the flesh to the Lord and allow him to work in us. So you can see where we're heading. Today is submission. The next week we're going to talk about solitude, really solitude and silence. Who needs a little bit more of that in your life these days? We're going to talk about prayer in a couple of weeks, confession, simplicity, and then service. On that date, uh, April 5th, uh, we'll experience together portions of the Messiah here in the sanctuary and also that afternoon. We've got special worship across the board on that day, Palm Sunday, as we do every week. But that's a special day for us here. And then the journey of the cross throughout Easter week, Holy Week. And then we'll have the silent Lord's Supper in the sanctuary on uh, Good Friday. So make note of all of that and be a part of it all as we move toward what I, what I like to call Resurrection Sunday. Uh, which is April 12th, and I'm asking all of us, challenging every one of us to, to ask the question, who's your one? Who's your one? Who are you seeking to reach for the Lord? Who might you invite to come join us on that glorious day? We've been looking at this Jesus, not that cultural Jesus, not, not that American Jesus that we made him out to be, but this Jesus. And, and, and now we're turning our hearts to him. What can we do in order to be with him? To know him and to obey him. That is the Christian life. Here's a key passage that I want all of us to memorize. Okay, every one of us over this period of time, you can do this. Three, three verses, some of you know this verse. And it says this. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want all of us to memorize that passage of scripture together. And I want us to develop these practices uh, marked by the life of Jesus, spiritual disciplines that will put us in position to hear from him, to rest in him and to follow him. In fact, Jesus taught us that the very beginning, the middle, the end of the Christian life is one of submission. In fact, in Luke 9, verse 23, you can see it there. He said to all of them, he says to us, if anyone come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Die to yourself daily and follow me. So what we see here in the Jesus tradition, it all starts with submission. And the ultimate example of submission, of course, is our Savior. And one of the most beautiful passages where we see this really summarized is in the book of Philippians. So I want you to turn there. Everyone across our campus today, Philippians 2, if, if you're uh, here, you have scripture there uh, in the pew racks in front of you. I hope you have, have the scripture before you. And I want us to walk together through this passage. Philippians 2, verses 1 through 11. We have a passage here, and then there's a poem, a beautiful a portrayal of 
of the submission, the life of Jesus. And here, Paul does a great job, as he always does, the word of God, bringing to us uh, not only what Jesus has done for us as the model, but then he also helps us with submission in real life. What does it look like in human relationships? So we're going to talk about that. In fact, I'll spend more time on the first portion of this sermon uh, than the latter two. I've got three really points we're going to see here. Submission starts in Christ, we're going to see. It, it, it points to Christ and it ends with Christ. You know, we're so much more comfortable, uh, while you're turning there, I want to offer this, to talk about self-awareness, self-fulfillment, self-discovery, than we are self-denial, right? That runs counter to our own thinking. And maybe for some of us, it's because self-denial feels like self-hatred, perhaps. We find ourselves caught in a dilemma between self-glorification, self-exaltation. We know we don't want to do that. And then we have self-hatred on the other side. But what if there's a third way? And I, and I offer this often. The gospel, the way of Jesus is often the third way. In a polarized culture and society that we live in even now, Jesus offers a third way that is the freeing way that leads us to happiness that's not dependent on me getting what I want. Imagine that. That my happiness and fulfillment, my contentment is not based on me getting my way. That is a radical, radical way to live. And yet it is the way of Jesus. And he teaches us. You see, it's the freedoms uh, uh, that come through the disciplines, as Richard Foster writes about in his book, The Celebration of Disciplines. He says every discipline has a corresponding freedom. The di discipline of submission is that I'm freed up in whatever situation I find myself in, I don't have to have my own way. That is a freeing way to live. Because the obsession and the demands to have my own way leads to great bondage and joyless living. Now, we expect that from a two-year-old, but not from adults, and certainly not from those who are pursuing Jesus. So let's talk about this. Submission starts in Christ. Here it is, verses 1 through 4. We find ourselves in him. Once we're in him, then he offers the reign and rule over our lives as Lord, as we've talked about so much in recent days. Look at verse 1. So, if there is, and the language here is, it's if, then, but there's also this assumed that this is true. Since, or if, then, there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, if, then, complete my joy by being in the same mind, having the same love, Notice the word same, being in full accord or same accord or identity and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition, that word is uh, self-interest is what it means, or conceit, that word means self-glory. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. What if everyone in the world lived that way? And that's exactly how we are called to live. In the church, there's a new order. And we hope that all of our guests who are here today, and as you get to know us and enter into life at Park City's Baptist Church, that you will see there's a different order of things here. That we submit to one another. And even the pastor who, who's the, the, the head of the organization, if you will, even I become servant number one. What does it mean even in leadership to submit to the spirit and to submit to one another in love? Let's talk about that. Because you see, he says here over and over again, notice the word, there's same, same love, one accord, same mind. We're all one in Christ. And as the Lord continues to do this work in our church and as I'm speaking now to, to people from around the world, literally, we're all created in the image of God. Every person is of value. We submit to one another because everyone here is the same at the foot of the cross. So we honor each other. 
But I want you to see that submission is a predetermined posture. If you take notes on sermons, I've got some sub points here. It's a predetermined posture. If you are in Christ, if you have received Christ and his grace and he's transformed your heart, you will live this way because this is the way of Jesus. In fact, Galatians 2.20, this happens to be uh, my wife, Stacy. It's her life verse. I have been crucified with Christ. I've submitted my life to him. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I've already died. Friends, this is so freeing. As I practice this, when I enter into a situation or head into the day or enter into a meeting, I don't have to have my way here in this moment. That's a freeing way to live. I read the story of a, of a missionary who was going into an unreached people group with his young wife. And they were heading in and they were going to go deeper into this tribe that had not heard the gospel. And the people told him, if you go in, those people will kill you. And he said this. He said, we died before we got here. And in this case, this young man literally was killed by the very people he sought to reach. But friends, if we have this posture and see that submission is a predetermined posture, we'll live our lives with a lot less anxiety. We'll recognize that I'm not in control. I'll submit to the will of God and it'll lead me into prayer. I know many of us are concerned. There's great anxiety around the globe, it seems, right? About the coronavirus. It's in the minds of many people. What do we do about that? We submit our anxieties and our worries to him in prayer. Have you been anxious about it? And I know many of us are watching the stock market. We're even wondering, are we safe here? We get the facts and then we be diligent, but we must first pray. Have you prayed? Is your first response to pray to submit your will to the Lord? Lord, I'm fearful. I give you my life. You're in control. You see, so many of us need to know that, yes, this is a serious matter. But we we know, too, that that some 2% of all who have been diagnosed, and I'm not making light of this at all, but I want to put it in context, about 2% uh, are, are, are fatalities when it comes to those diagnosed with the with the coronavirus. The seasonal flu is somewhere around 1%. Now, some have said that it becomes less or more as those are diagnosed. But I'm saying all this to say, let's get the facts straight and then let's be diligent. And we're doing that even here at the church. You need to know that. Always seeking to provide a safe and secure environment for our children. In fact, our long-range planning committee has been working and presenting. And our deacons have been involved in this process as well as as many committees have been. We're going to be able to present to you in March a plan that will help us to upgrade the security and the care for our children in our preschool area because we want to provide a safe and secure environment. But friends, we've got to submit our fears to the Lord and we lay them before him so that faith replaces our fears as we trust in him. Now look at this. Submission is practiced in relationships. Now I'm going to spend the bulk of our time here because this is real life. This is where we all need to understand, how do I submit to the needs and interests of others as more important than my own? Submission to others, opinions, perspectives, and experiences, uh, and even desires is necessary for any healthy relationships. And so we've got to figure out how to do this. It's likely that if you're in conflict with someone in your life, and let's think about your life now, seek, seek to apply this, it's likely that the conflict you're facing is because you want your way and you're not able to listen and hear and understand their perspective. Now, granted, that goes both ways. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, he speaks to this. Listen to this. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't you know that they come from your desires that battle within? Listen, conflict outside of us starts with conflict inside of us. It's what the scriptures refer to as pride. We call it sin. 
in the Bible. Sin leads to pride, which is the opposite of submission. It brings about antonyms, words like fight, battle, object, and oppose. We see a lot of that in our society today. But many of us, we approach our relationship with God that way. And yet, he goes on to say this. You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. And then he says, why don't you just ask God to provide what you need? Again, why don't you submit to him and ask him? He says, you ask, but you do not receive. Do you know this passage? Because you ask with the wrong motives. He says, well, what are those wrong motives? He says, so. He says, you want to just please yourself. How about that? Even in our prayers, we're, we're self-focused. Are your prayers marked by, Lord, give me, give me, give me, and Lord, do this, please. Leo, do this and take care of that person. Would you? Thank you very much. And how about that person driving me crazy? Thank you. You're, listen, you're not submitting to the Lord in prayer. And submission is the entire posture of prayer. We submit to his will. That's what prayer really is all about. Yes, we bring our desires and our hopes to him. But if we're not submitting to him in prayer, why would we think he's going to answer our prayers? Because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. How can I be certain that God doesn't oppose me? Submission. Submitting my will to him. And it is a sin battle for every one of us. So see, submission starts with our relationship with God. Submission in relationships is unavoidable. Some of you may know there's 59 one another's in the New Testament. And just about all of them really have to do with submitting ourselves to one another in some form, some way. So submission is key. Do you consider others as more important than yourself? Think about your life right now. Where can you apply this? In Ephesians 5, Paul talks about the way of the cross in human relationships. And he begins, and I want to I just hang out here for just a moment. I'll show you a couple of verses here. But he notes that the way of Jesus is the way of submission applied to all relationships. This was staggering in the first century, by the way. This teaching is radical. And at the beginning there of Ephesians 5, he says, be imitators of God in your relationships just as, he says, walk in love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Back again, everything coming back to the model of Jesus. And then he says, be filled with the Spirit. So the umbrella over all of this teaching in human relationships and submission is all about being filled first with the Spirit. And then here's what he says. He says, giving thanks always, you can see it there, and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another, mutual submission, out of reverence for Christ. We submit to one another. Then he gives this specific and sometimes troubling teaching in verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands, your own husbands, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, or like as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. So again, everything comes back to Christ, who submitted to the Father's will. And then look at what he says. Now, as the church submits... To Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. So wives submit to their husbands in the same way we all, husbands included, are submitting to Christ. Then he says, husbands, love your wives. Agape, your wives as, most important word in the sentence, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I've asked women many times through the years, if your husband is constantly submitting to the Lord Jesus and the Lordship of Christ in his life, even imperfectly, if he's pursuing Christ daily, would you have trouble submitting to him? I've never had a woman say, oh, yes, I would. It's always been, no, I will follow a man. I will partner with a man. Whom, whom, uh, who God has entrusted with our marriage and our lives together and, and, and who is now submitting to Jesus every single day. 
You see, Paul then goes on to tell children to submit, I mean, uh, yeah, children to submit to parents. Now, now, wives submitting to husbands and children submitting to parents, that was not revolutionary, even in the first century. But what was revolutionary is this umbrella teaching of mutual submission, self-denial under Christ. So what we see here is a new order of things. The way that we live in our families, our marriages, and in the church, and in relationships, this is applied to single adults, young people, to all of us. The new order and the most fundamental feature of the way of Jesus is submission. Constant submission of our lives. So there's universal subordination. Husbands dying to themselves. I could argue that the husbands have the higher calling, the more difficult challenge. So wives can flourish under that kind of love. That was and is a radical teaching. And then for fathers not to unduly exasperate their children. Be kind and gentle in your discipline. That was revolutionary teaching. Even treating uh, servants with honor and respect was, was radical, revolutionary teaching. And it is the way of Jesus even still. So the sequence, the new, new order is first submission to a triune God. Submission to, to, to others in, 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 in the family. We see submission to scripture. We see as we look at the New Testament, even submission to spiritual leaders in the church whom God has called out. We talk about servant leadership in the church because we recognize that leadership in the kingdom is different from what we see out in the world. And so our deacons who serve us, our staff, our, our pastors who are called out, we're servant leaders. We submit to the Lord in prayer. So who do you submit to? Submit to those, certainly those who are pursuing Christ. And friends, I, I, I promise I continue to seek the Lord every day. I stood in this spot when I came here in view of a call. I guess it was my first Sunday here. And I said, as Paul did, all I desire, follow me as I follow Christ. As we do this together. And I'm so excited to welcome uh, Pastor Rolando Aguirre and his family to our church family. I know our, our Spanish-speaking ministries and, and all of our people are excited, and I want us all to welcome him and to bless him as he comes, as we gather together in the commons next week to celebrate his coming. We'll all get to know him in the days to come. So we submit even to one another within community. In the church, we submit to the needs of others. How about that? Those who are hurting and broken, we submit to their needs. So, submission starts in Christ, submission points to Christ. Look at this, verse 5. Have this mind among you yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, and that is to, to be held on to. Instead, he let go, emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is the way of Jesus. So here's what we see here. Submission is promised in a person. Once we enter into relationship, and look at this, it says, you have this mind. It's yours in Christ. This mind, it means opinion, viewpoint. This is how you live. But you do it in him. And you might say, well, Jeff, I, you don't know my boss. You don't know my husband. You don't understand. You don't know my coach, my teachers. How can I do this? Of course Jesus was able to do this. He was the son of God. He was the suffering servant. Of course he was able to live this way. And listen, yes. And he calls you to live exactly like him. That is following the way of Jesus. And in 1 Corinthians 2.16, you have the mind of Christ. You can have a discerning mind in how to do this. Submission, look at this, is provided through humility. We've already talked about that. It's, it's Jesus, humility personified. Jesus took every ounce, listen, of his privilege 
and he laid it down for the sake of others. This is the life we've been called to live. Submission is personified in a person. Now, I know that sounds a bit redundant, but how do I live this way? What does submission look like? Look at your rabbi. Look at Jesus. Watch him serve others. Watch him care for the woman at the well. Watch him seek out the lowly and the marginalized. Watch him wash the disciples' feet. We're to do the same. So are you living this way in your life? And how might you do this? How can you do it this week? Richard Foster offers this quote. Jesus not only died across death, he lived across life. You see, the way of Jesus is the way of the suffering servant. You see, to be living a life of humility really can lead to humiliation. Where I lay myself and my needs before others. And again, we follow Jesus. As apprentices of Jesus, we do what he did. So I hope the Spirit is speaking to your heart. How will you do this this week and this season? Being in Christ, submission begins. Submission points to Christ. And finally, submission ends with Christ. Christ is the start and finish of the Christian life. Look at verse 9. Therefore, because all of this is true, because he did all of this, God has highly exalted him. And bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That is to say everywhere throughout all the universe, throughout the heavens. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. God the Father. You see, you can bow down before him now. Or you will bow down before him later. He's Lord of all. Whether you think he is or not, whether you place him in that position or not, he's Lord, he's master. So look at this, in the upside down kingdom, the greatest servant of all becomes the master and Lord of all. And in the same way, he lifts us up. When we live this way, it's a faith decision on our part. But look, submission is the pathway to joy. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. The ultimate act of submission. Joy is found, friends, in doing the will of the Father. And then finally, submission is the purpose of life. I hope you've captured that today. You know, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And this happens as we first submit to him. Your purpose in life is to submit to the Father's will. One day at a time, one moment at a time. Many of us are wondering, what's God's purpose for me? How can I discover his will for my life? We're always asking those questions. Submit to him. That is his will for your life. And then he will show you every single day how to live. So submission starts in Christ, it points to Christ, and it ends with Christ. Paul says in this passage that Jesus left his position in heaven. He came to be one of us came to dwell among us, and then he died on the cross for your sins so that you wouldn't have to die. He took on the punishment for your sins so you wouldn't live in shame. And he was raised again so that you might follow him in resurrected life. Have you received his grace? Have you asked him to come into your heart? Friend, today is your day. The prayer of submission is summed up in the prayers of Jesus that we find in that final night before he went to the cross. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he says this, my father, a third time, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Here it is, not, yet not as I will, but as you will. Friends, that's the prayer of life. We're called to, to come before him, express our desires and our hopes, and yet not my will, but yours be done. And then he would be arrested that night. He would be flogged and beaten the next day. He would go to the cross on our behalf so that we could live a life of submission as well for our good and to his glory. So have you received his grace today? Have you received his his love for you? 
Because friend, every one of us, we need something greater than a Copernican revolution. We need a transformation of the heart. And it comes as we submit to our loving Father and give our lives to Him. Do you know Him? Are you living a life of submission to Him? This is the way of Jesus, the way to joy and purpose in our lives. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for how you've spoken into our hearts today. And now I ask, Lord, that each person here, particularly those who've never received your grace, that they would do so right now. And I ask, Lord, that, uh, that you would reveal yourself to each of us. So, friend, just by faith, just say, yes, Lord, come into my life and make me the person you've created to be, me to be. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. And for the rest of us, all of us, pray a prayer of submission to him now. Lord, we submit our lives to you. We fall down before you. We submit to you. In every area of our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.